Hey everyone, I'm sitting here with a bunch of differently shaped objects, things of different sizes and shapes here. And basically what we're looking at is we just started talking about algebraic expressions. And what we really want to do is take algebraic expressions and turn it into how to use formulas. And our eventual goal is going to be to be able to find volumes of these different types of shapes. Uh, we have cylinders, we have rectangular prisms, we have spheres. This is an, a perfect cone. This is something called a truncated cone. If you imagine this going up, it will eventually reach to a point, but we cut it off, so that's why it's called truncated. Um, and then uh, there's the most coveted cylinder that we have right now. You might call it the holy grail of cylinders, the toilet paper roll. Now the concept of volume actually has to deal with stacking things. So if you look at these packs of gums, uh, the main shape is a rectangle here, but as a three-dimensional object, it is a rectangular prism. But if I wanted to find the whole volume of this, basically I start with the bottom part, and let's assume that this is just one unit high here. So I would start with the bottom part, find the area of this, and then I would just basically stack one on top of the other to find the whole air or the whole volume of these so the the first thing that we have to consider when trying to find the volume and this is something called a prism when the the top and the bottom are the same shape all right so when you're trying to find the volume of a prism the most important part is actually what shape is the base all right and the base is the, the two sides of that three-dimensional object that are the same shape and parallel to each other. So going back to this, we've got, this is the same shape. It is congruent to the top part of this and they are parallel to each other. Same idea with a cylinder, all right? The base would be considered a circle because the circle is the same on the bottom and the top. So those are the bases. And if we wanted to find the volume, and I'm talking about stacking here, we can stack one can on top of another. So that's kind of the concept. Find the area of the base and then just stack that base one on top of the other. So the focus of today's lesson is going to be about finding the area of bases. And bases could be a bunch of different shapes. It could be a square, it could be a rectangle, it could be a triangle, it could be a circle. Um, basically any shape that you can think of, trapezoid, rhombus, um, that could be the shape of a base of a prism. So that's what our focus is going to be. It's going to be on the, the area of those two dimensional objects. Specifically, we're gonna be looking at rectangles, triangles, and circles, because those are the common shapes that are going to be used for three dimensional objects. Now, this is a list of a lot of the area and perimeter formulas. And just remember, the reason for doing the algebraic expressions was to get into using formulas. So this is no different. All of these are just algebraic expressions, and we will eventually get values to put into the equations for the variables, and then just follow the order of operations. So we have area, which represents the amount of space inside of that two-dimensional shape, and then perimeter, which is the distance around that shape. And before we go any further, one other thing we need to talk about is the units that we use for area and perimeter. So when we're looking at measurements of area, area is measured in square units because like we said, we're literally talking about the amount of space inside and we're talking about the number of squares that we could fit inside of a shape. And you see it as um, SQIN, the SQ stands for square. You might see with an exponent, feet squared. It might say meter squared. Uh, all of those are types of ways that you're going to see the units for area. For perimeter and circumference, it's really just a length. So it's measured with a standard unit. So it's just inches, meters, miles, feet, or any abbreviations of those. So don't worry, we're not going to use all of these formulas to start off with. We're going to stick with three basic ones, circles, rectangles, and triangles. And when looking at these, formulas are fantastic, but if you have no idea what the variables mean, formulas are completely and utterly useless. So below this chart, I have some definitions of the formulas, and these should be a review, but in case not, we're gonna go over them. So if we're looking at circles, R 
represents the radius, which is the length from the center to the edge, as pictured in the in the uh, diagram here. The diameter is the whole way across the length of the circle. So this little part right here, that would be the radius, and the diameter, as mentioned, would go all the way across the circle through the center. All right, starting at the edges of the circle. So I went a little bit beyond the circle, but know that it stops right at the edge. Um, another important thing to remember, and literally our last day of school before we got this break from the coronavirus, we celebrated Pi Day. And we celebrated Pi Day because Pi is approximately equal to 3.14. So on March 14th, we celebrated Pi Day. Um, it is an irrational number that goes on forever and ever and ever, but the standard approximation that we can use is 3.14. You could also use calculated Pi. It's a, a little bit more accurate. Um, the other thing I want to point out about circles is when we look at perimeter, a circle has its own special name for perimeter. It's called circumference. Circumference literally just means go around the outside of the circle. For rectangles, the length and the width are the two sides of the rectangle. So W stands for width, L stands for length, but they're interchangeable. Um, it's okay if you wanted to use this side for the length and this side for the width. That's, that's perfectly fine. Um, and then for the triangles, B is the base, which I don't want you to think that B always means the bottom, a base always means the bottom. When you think of base, you typically think of the bottom. It is possible that the base is on the top of the triangle, that it's on the side of the triangle. The only thing that we have to recognize is that the base is always a side of the triangle. And H, the way that you look for H is it's going to be perpendicular to the base. So you might see that little square there representing a 90 degree angle. And it is actually possible for the height to be a side. If you get a right triangle, this could end up being your base and that could end up being your height. Um, as I mentioned, the base doesn't have to be on the bottom. Uh, let's pretend that we had a triangle like this and our 90 degree angle was right there. If that was the situation you were dealing with, this side would represent the base and this would represent the height, also meaning that height isn't necessarily from the bottom to the top, like we think of height as normal. The height always represents the distance from wherever the base is to the opposite vertex of that. So when you're looking for identifying the base and the height, always look for that 90 degree angle. And those are the two measurements that you use for the base and the height. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the types of problems we'll see using these formulas. So Lamar wants to paint the ceiling of his restaurant. The ceiling is in the shape of a square and its side lengths are 48 feet. And it says, suppose each can of paint will cover 192 square feet. How many cans will be needed to paint the ceiling? I'm gonna take a screenshot of this real quick so we can right on top of this here. Um, so information that we know, we know we have a square. And all sides of the square are the same. So we know that this is 48. A square is a type of rectangle. So to find the area, we know the area is length times width. So to find that area, once again, just like algebraic equations, we are going to substitute values for those variables in and just follow the order of operations. This one's simple. We just have to take 48 times 48. 48 times 48 is 2,304. And we're talking about feet, so we have feet squared here, or square feet. And then the next part of this, and the reason that the, the rectangles are gonna be a little bit more complex is because really the area of a rectangle is about the easiest one that we can do. Um, so the area of a rectangle is length times width. We got 2,304 square feet. And it says we wanna paint this 
and each can will cover 192 square feet. So we need to figure out how many cans do we need for this. And this is a simple division problem. So we're going to take 2,304 divided by the 192 that each can can cover. And that gives us 12 cans. So our answer here is 12 cans of paint. Our next type of problem is the area of a right triangle, and they put this on a coordinate system for us. And remember, when we're finding the area of a triangle, the area is one half base times height. So what we need to do is find the 90 degree angle, and it's right here. And the fact that this is a right triangle kind of makes this nice. We're just looking at the legs. So right here, this could be the height, and this could be the base. And they're actually interchangeable in this case. And to identify them, we just have to count. Uh, we notice that every block is one unit, so the height is two, and the base ends up being seven when we count them. And formulas are an algebraic expression or equation. So we just have to substitute the known values. So B equals seven, so we'll put seven in for B, and H equals two. So we'll put two in for H and just follow the order of operations. Um, now, with multiplication, we're allowed to do it in any order that we want. I think this is super easy. 7 times 2 is 14, and half of 14 is 7. So this one would be 7 square units. And in this case, if we don't know what the unit is, if we don't know that it is feet or inches or meters, etc., we are going to use just units. So we would say this is square units. And the nice part about this is we literally see what this means by looking at the block. So we know that there's one, two, there's three whole blocks. This block right here would combine with maybe this block right here to give us the four. This block here would combine with this block here to give us a five. This one would be six combined with this one. And this one right here combined with that block would give us seven. So that shows how there are seven total squares inside of this triangle. Got another triangle problem, not on a, a coordinate plane. And also the base is not on the bottom. So I really like this problem to get that point across. So once again, we look straight for what formula do we have to use? We're trying to find the area of a triangle. So we know area of a triangle is one half base times height. And as mentioned before, we look for that 90 degree angle to help us identify the base and the height. There's a 90 degree angle. What two measurements make that? It's the 14 right here and the five. So that is what we're gonna be using for our base and our height. So we substitute 14 in for the base and five in for the height and we do our order of operations. Um, this is nice that the base is an even number. Even numbers are always nice and easy to take halves of. So half of 14 is seven, and seven times five is 35. And this one, they give us a unit. We know that we're dealing with feet, so we're talking about the number of square feet inside of this triangle. So our answer is 35 square feet. And our last type of problem deals with circles. And this is the only one that we have to look at the area and the circumference of. Um, so our formulas for circles, area is pi r squared, and circumference is either pi times diameter, or we can look at 2 pi r. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. So first of all, area, pi r squared. We know that pi equals 3.14. And that's what they tell us we should use for, use the value of 3.14 for pi. And the radius is 8. Radius, remember, being from the center of the circle out to the, the edge or halfway across the circle. Now here, we actually have to take into consideration the order of operations. So we have to do exponents first. So 8 squared is 64. And then 64 times pi or 3.14 is 200.96. And if you notice in the answer, they're asking what type of units are we supposed to use? Feet, square feet, or cubic feet. And since this one's dealing with area, we need to use the square feet. So this is 
0.96 feet squared here. Um, and technically, what I should be doing, as soon as I put 3.14 in 4 pi, I should be saying this is approximately equal to. Um, because pi, remember, is an irrational number that goes on forever and ever and ever, and we will never have an exact decimal for pi. So as soon as we substitute 3.14 in for pi, we get an approximate answer. So the area of this circle is approximately 200.96 feet squared. Um, be careful when it says do not round your answers. A lot of people think, oh, that means that it's a, it is exact, but there is no exact decimal for pi. Um, the next one, the circumference, all right, remember how I mentioned circumference is pi times the diameter. It could also be 2 pi r because 2 times the radius gives you the diameter. So one thing that we have to keep in mind here is this 8 equals the radius. We can just double that to go straight across and figure out that d is actually 16, what we get when we double 8. So the circumference, once again, I'm going to put an approximately equal because I'm going to put 3.14 in for pi times 16. So my answer is approximately 50.24. And circumference is just the length around the outside of that circle. So we're just dealing with feet here. So the circumference is 50.24 feet. Your assignment for this lesson is going to be on alex.com. It is called area of bases. There are 12 questions worth one point each. And as always, I'm always available on Zoom Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday during your scheduled math class and also during my office hours. So please, if you need any help, go ahead and join me in that or you can send me an email. But honestly, Zoom is the best way because I can specifically help you with your type of question that you are dealing with. Good luck.